This happened to me last summer. First, let me just say that this is a true story, so it might be a little short and maybe not so interesting. However, this experience made me start to wonder if maybe ghosts really do exist. Up until then, I never believed in them. But now, well... I'm a full-time worker now, so I no longer live at home, but I always return to my parents' house for New Year's and the Obon holidays. I don't usually keep in contact or hang out with my childhood friends who still live in town, but when I arrived back home on this particular night, we all decided to head out to the river for a barbecue. A came to pick us up in his wagon, and B was already inside with a camera in hand. We then went to pick the others up one by one, like we always did. C and D, who both had the following day off, joined us, and then we decided to go pay E a visit even though we couldn't initially get in contact with him. A was four years older than the rest of us and always looked after us. Ever since I was a kid, he was like a big brother to me. He got a car license when we were in junior high and he always drove us around everywhere. He wasn't a terribly ambitious or selfish guy, nor did he really stand out too much. B was the type to get easily carried away, but he cared about his childhood friends more than anyone else. He practiced karate and shorinji kempo ever since he was small, so he was like our leader who always rushed in head first. But once he bought a camera, he was always there behind us filming everything. He started doing this after he started full-time work as well. When we all get together, those are the most precious memories for me, he said. C was the girl who lived next door to me ever since we were in elementary school. She remained close like family even after they moved. She was just like one of the boys up until sixth grade, but after that, she started to grow her hair and act more feminine. My parents honestly thought that C and I would get married one day, and every time I saw them after I started work, they were like, So, when's the wedding? I've known her since I was just a kid, so I don't really see her that way at all, but she's pretty popular with other men. D was always a free spirit who did whatever he wanted. As soon as he turned 18, he decided he was going to gamble on his life in Las Vegas and move to America without speaking any English. He lost everything and almost became a vagrant there. The first thing he said upon returning home was, I sure would have been in deep shit if I didn't buy a return ticket first. E was accomplished in both sports and smarts. He was intelligent, physically strong, and a great judge of things. He was like a perfect main character you might see in a manga. His weak point was that he was rather outspoken, so this often resulted in small quarrels. In contrast to A, He was rather ambitious and a little full of himself. And once again, A is our designated driver, huh? I said in the car with a laugh. Dude, don't call me that. If I don't pick you up, then you'll all just park your junk at my house. So anyway, I heard that E quit his job. Seriously? I said. But he said that programming was pretty fun. What's he doing now? What a waste of a brain. Ah, yeah, I heard that too, B said. Well, it is E, so maybe he quit to start his own business or something. But still, I wonder what happened, I said. Well, he was student president in junior and high school, and he was first in his class at university, so I'm sure he had a good reason, B replied. I mean, he's already bought an apartment with cash at this age while I'm still living at home, A said with a laugh. Talk then turned to trivial matters. Hey, is eggplant on a stick really that good? D asked me. Hmm, you still smell the same. It puts me at ease, C said. Yeah, well, it's hot, you know, I replied. Before long, we arrived at E's house. We saw him standing in the window upstairs, so we called out, but I guess he didn't hear us. He seemed to just 
take a brief glance at us and then went back inside. He looked a little thinner than usual, but it was definitely E. We parked in front of the building and then B, C, D and I went to check on him. I went to press the button for his apartment, but then B said, He's probably not back at his room yet. But hey, the entrance will open just fine with the manager's code. He then easily opened the door. How did he know the manager's code? We quickly arrived at E's place. It seemed the air conditioner was set to 18 degrees, as usual. The front door was covered in condensation. We opened the door at the same time we pressed the intercom button, and then the four of us yelled in unison, E! We're heading out! But there was no response. We saw him enter the building just before. The lights were on, and so was the air conditioner. We decided to wait for a bit, thinking that maybe he took the stairs rather than the elevator. But several minutes passed and still there was no sign of E. Was he inside? We decided to go in and have a look. We walked through the hall, which smelt of coconut, E's favourite smell. As we reached the living room door, I could see E inside. He seemed to be sleeping. There he is! I said, and then we all burst inside. E was lying down with his back to us. What the hell are you doing? We yelled together, the camera pointed at him. Despite how much noise we made, E didn't even twitch. Unsettled, we approached him just to discover that he was dead. He seemed to have been dead for quite some time, as his skin had changed colour and looked like it was about to start decomposing. I formally put my fingers to his cold neck to check for breathing or a pulse, but there were no signs of life. Nothing made any sense. We came up here chasing after E, and yet he had clearly been dead for quite some time. After confirming he was gone, we called the police, fire department, and E's family. B, holding the camera, started trembling as soon as I said, He's dead. Tears streamed down C's face as she clutched the edge of her skirt, and D started screaming. What the hell, man? We just saw him walking around a few minutes ago. Huh? A said when I called him. He was still waiting downstairs. What on earth are you talking about? We just saw him. He didn't believe me. The police and fire department are coming now, I said. It was all I could say. Before long they arrived and we explained the situation. We followed him up here, we said, and of course the police were confused. I caught it all on camera, B said, and then showed them what he recorded. In it, You could see E lit up by the car's headlights. We were all in shock. They soon finished interviewing us on the scene, and then forensics showed up. They confiscated the camera and SD card, and then let us go, saying they would contact us again in a few days. Unable to calm down, we went to a family restaurant for a bit. Then, as the sun started to rise, we all went our separate ways home. C didn't want to be alone, so she decided to join me. The next day, the police contacted us to come to the station for an interview. They soon let us go after telling them about what happened when we discovered him, but they still didn't know his cause of death, and there were several points that struck them as suspicious. They were still investigating to determine whether he died of illness or whether he'd been murdered. They showed us photos of his bedroom to see if they jogged our memories on anything, but the walls were painted red and covered in Shinto charms. It was creepy. We all returned to our regular daily lives after the Obon holidays, but we were still in shock over E's death. Around the start of September, we received news that E died of illness. He had been dead for about a week when we found him, but the air conditioning had kept him from decaying. And that was the end of that.
or so I thought. Around the start of October, I suddenly got a call from B. It was the first time he'd called me so far from the New Year holidays. I got my camera back, so I checked it again and... He seemed to be having a hard time saying what he wanted to say. You mean the footage with E, yeah? What about it? We watched it with the police that day, yeah? But the tape is a little different now. Huh? Look, there's no way I'm going to be able to understand this over the phone, so burn it onto a CD for me and send it over. Also, the original data on that SD card is the last footage we have of E, so save that too, I said. Yeah, I'm not going to erase that, B said. But don't tell C. She's still upset and all. I knew that B had liked C since at least junior high school. I watched the CD when it arrived, and just like he said, it was definitely different to when we watched it on the day. E had just glanced at us, but in the video, he stared at us for several seconds. Did you edit this? I asked B, but he said he hadn't touched it. I enlarged it and watched it several times, but I couldn't find anything else different, so I left it at that. In November, another CD arrived from B. The video has changed again, said a letter inside. The file I copied onto my computer hasn't changed. Only the one on the SD card has. When I watched it, E seemed to be talking to the camera. I couldn't hear anything, nor could I make out what he was saying, but his mouth was moving. When I returned home for the end of the year, eight of us childhood friends got together and held a big welcome home, year-end, and year-start party like we always did. The only thing different was that E wasn't there. Around lunchtime on January 1st, the party that had been going since December 31st finally ended and we all went our separate ways. I went back to my parents' house first and then to B's. Once there, we checked the video again and, once more, it had changed. It was difficult to make out, but it sounded like E was groaning. Maybe he was trying to tell us something. There was nothing we could do but wait until he could tell us. This month, February, I received a video where I could just barely hear him. Everyone, thank. I'm sorry. I can't. Don't go near. That's all we've been able to make out so far. The voice jumps in and out, so I may have misheard the first part where he was thanking us. Was the second part of the message trying to protect us from death? E's message is still ongoing and changing. If ghosts really do exist and you could talk to them, I'd love to see E again. What does he want to tell us? What happened to him? But I also want to tell him something. I want to tell him, thank you. This is B. This is a follow-up to my friend in the tape. T, who posted the previous story, wrote everything that happened up until Golden Week of 2012. This is related to all of that, and I'm posting what he wrote. I wrote that after E's death, We returned to our regular daily lives, but after having seen such a strange situation take place firsthand, I decided to investigate it. I tried not to let the other three see his bulging, wide-open eyes and the scratches on his neck. I can still vividly remember the insane photos the police showed me of his bedroom as well. During my investigations, I visited E's mother on numerous weekends to check that she was okay. His father passed away before I met him as a child, and she did her best to raise him all alone. Because it would take my friends about three hours one way on the plane to return to our hometown, 
or five hours on the bullet train, I decided not to contact any of them during my trips. I only contacted C, who cried every time she remembered home. My parents would have been worried if I showed up back home too often, so I often spent the night in a hotel with C instead, splitting the cost. Sorry B, we didn't do anything together, don't worry. After talking to E's mother about half a year after his death, I got permission to go through his apartment and belongings, and I found a laptop and a notebook stuck to the back of the drawer in his desk. They looked like they might hold some clues, so I borrowed them from his mother and took them home to investigate further. What is it about smart people? Like doctors, why is their handwriting always so messy? There were keywords written all over the place ignoring the lines, and calculations scribbled here and there. There was even some wild stuff like, what our friends should bring to the wedding of C and I. All of this was just in his head, of course. Just looking at the contents of the notebook made my head hurt. But then, as I reached the end, I found a page with the words, Campsite Candidates written in large letters. Beneath that, there were various words written, like several numbers, and the words abandoned road and cave. Using the numbers as latitude and longitude, I found a potential campsite candidate, and then I found a hidden folder on his PC with those same numbers that was locked behind a password. I tried various words related to E, and in the end, It was C's name that unlocked it. Inside was a report on the location in question, and a situation forecast. It seemed that, while researching for our yearly summer camp, he came across something interesting. Every year, all of us childhood friends always went camping together during the summer. When we were in elementary school, our parents went camping with us, but when A got his driver's license when we were in junior high, We went alone after that. And once our parents stopped joining us, well, we didn't have much money, so our camps tended to be outside of camping grounds, and all we had was just a bit of food and water, some snacks and firewood. That was it. It was more like a survival camp. But it was the thing I looked forward to most each year, maybe because I lived in the city, and it was a nice escape to spend some time in nature. So anyway, that was why it was hard to find places to camp, and in some worst-case scenarios, we had to camp in the forest by the side of the road near the prefectural border. When I put the coordinates into a navigation map I found in E's laptop, it pointed to a mountain on the border. There were also several photos in the hidden folder of the site in question, so I looked at them in order. There was an abandoned road, a river, a waterfall, the waterfall basin, and a cell phone, out of range, and then a cave next to the basin. The waterfall was about 20 minutes from the river by the abandoned road, and there was a cave next to that, so it seemed that camping there was possible. I was impressed that he even tested the quality of the river water with a testing kit first. After reading a little more, it seemed the cave appeared after a recent earthquake caused a cliff to collapse. The cave was two metres high and one and a half metres wide. It gradually got narrower the further you went in and was about 20 metres long. The walls weren't wet and there was no airflow, so it was a dead end. The rock walls were also solid, so there was little fear of collapse. However, even though this was a natural cave that appeared after a cliff collapsed in an earthquake, there were traces of artificial blockage at the rear. The wall beside the rear was about to collapse and another cave continued even further in. While the cave on this side was made of natural rock, the cave on the other side was about 70 centimetres long and wide and it was partially walled off with bricks or something man-made. E managed to make a hole in the wall and enter the other cave, but the other cave didn't lead outside, but rather 
down into the ground. Because he wasn't sure of the oxygen levels or if there might be toxic gases, he went home for the day, then returned with a manual compressor. Something like a vaporizer you might find in a home center, with an additional tank. He walked for a while as he pumped air into his mask, and then it seemed he finally reached the deepest part of the cave. He gradually reduced the air pressure and checked to see if he could breathe freely, as he would pass out immediately if it was full of gas. The room was about three by five meters, and in the back was something like a man-made altar. He examined it and found a pattern he'd never seen before, alongside something that looked like a sarcophagus. There was a beautiful black stone, and when he touched it, he heard a voice in his head, but he had no idea what it was saying. It was a language he'd never heard before. What the hell? He grew more and more terrified, and then ran from the cave. Even though it should have only been around two in the afternoon, outside was pitch black, and his watch had stopped at one. The darkness and the voices that wouldn't stop scared him to the bottom of his soul, so he immediately went home. Although he couldn't remember much, apparently about eight hours had passed. He tried to go to bed, but the voices wouldn't stop, so he got up and summarized everything that happened. Nothing made sense after touching that sarcophagus, however, so he got annoyed and gave up. He decided to visit a specialist the next day, wondering if schizophrenia was the cause of the voices that wouldn't stop. And after that, his diary took a turn, recording events in mostly words and short sentences. He took medicine, but his symptoms got worse by the day. On the fifth day after touching the sarcophagus, he started to see something like red mist clouding his vision. He visited the doctor and told them that things were getting worse, so please change his medicine. But nothing worked. On the 15th day, he did some research on the internet and requested help from various sects. He visited them day after day, but nothing helped. On the 27th day, he was so frightened about the red mist clouding his vision that he painted his room red, so he couldn't see it. On the 35th day, he visited a shrine and told them he was being haunted by something big and powerful. He received some charms and put them up in his room, although he had no idea if they would help. On the 40th day, a spirit medium recommended a particular charm, and so he bought it. On the 45th day, an eye started looking at him through the haze, although he couldn't tell if it was human or animal. On the 50th day, neither the medicines nor charms worked. He had no idea what the cause was, nor did he understand why. On the 70th day, the voices that lived non-stop in his head spoke Japanese for a moment. It's time, they said. Seemed he was nearing the end. He wrote a letter. To mum, thank you for giving birth to me. Thank you for raising me. After dad died, I know that you didn't get married again for my sake, even though you were young. I know that you worked your hardest without receiving welfare for my benefit. I was always worried when I saw you passed out in the living room after working so hard all day. But thanks to you, I had the best life with the best friends. Thank you. To all my friends, I really wanted to write to you individually but I don't think I have the time. I really wanted to go camping with you guys this year again too. I can't put into words how thankful I am and how much you saved me. Especially A, one year older than me. D, the same age as me. B, one year younger than me. And T and C, two years younger than me. We're all different ages, but we all lived close together. I didn't think that we'd be friends for our entire lives. My life would have been worthless without you guys in it. Thank you. 
That was the end of the diary in his notebook and computer. There was no record of the 71st day, which was about a week before I returned home and the day they think he died. Most of the files in the hidden computer were also password protected, so it took a while to open them, but they explained what I wrote above. I think I now understand what E was trying to say in that video B sent just before Golden Week. Everyone, thank you. I'm sorry I can't hang out with you guys anymore. There is a dangerous location on the prefectural border. Don't go near it. E has still been looking out for us even after death, and it makes me mad that that sarcophagus caused all of this even more. But as I was researching all this, I heard a bell ring in my head. I'll be investigating that cave during the summer because of the danger of winter snow. During Golden Week, I'll do some recon and prepare the stuff I need to go there myself. This is B, and this is a follow-up to my friend in the tape too. I'm posting this for T, who wrote about the 2012 Golden Week holidays. T wrote this himself at the end as well, but it seems he was rather scared of that cave. There were so many sentences and conversations that weren't necessary. He wrote two pieces about Golden Week, but I've taken the longer one, as it paints a bigger picture of T and C. During Golden Week of 2012, I quickly returned to my parents' house, but before then, I went to visit E's mother to return the stuff I'd borrowed. There was a message here for you, I told her, but I erased everything else from the laptop and notebook. After returning those, I went to visit B, who was the only one who knew about the video. B was intrigued by the thing on the prefectural border, but I told him, we don't have any clues, so there's no way for us to look for it. I knew that if I told B about the cave, then he would immediately want to go, so I prepared quietly without telling anyone about it. That night, I got on my bike because I knew it would be too difficult to find a car park and went to our usual friend's reunion for the holidays. D, being the usual free spirit he was, didn't attend because he was apparently on a bike trip around the country. Every now and then C looked at me like she wanted to say something, but then she just drank her oolong tea. Once the party was over, we were deciding whether to head to another place or go home for the night, when C said she wanted to talk to me privately. I was tired from both the trip back and the party, so we went to a cafe and I got an espresso to try to perk up. Do you remember M from my class in the fifth grade? C asked me. Ah, yeah I do. We were in the same grade in junior high too. She was cute, but always alone, right? She always seemed like she was afraid of me or didn't like me much, so we never spoke. Come to think of it, I don't think I ever saw her talk to anyone but you. She didn't hate you. Apparently she can see guardian spirits or something behind people sometimes, so she avoided those people. Anyway, I suddenly got a call from her last week asking if you were okay. She said she wanted to see you. Eh? You moved in the sixth grade, right? You came to our graduation ceremony by car and then saw your parents off because you wanted to hang out with us. My dad had to drop you off after that. So, how does M know your phone number? I asked. Huh? We moved to a new house within the same city, so our number didn't change. You called me so many times over the years and you never realised? Holy crap, I can't believe you, C said. Well, now that you mention it, yeah, your number didn't change, huh? So it was the same number in our graduation album. Anyway, if she wants to see me, as long as it's not this day or this day, then it's fine. Do you think she's grown into a hot babe? I wanted to see her again one more time while we were still in our 20s. You know what? I'm done here. You must be tired as well from all that travel. Ah... Yeah, sorry. Your parents will probably want to chat for a while if I run into them, so do you want me to just drop you off in front of your house? I asked. 
They'll hear your bike though. I always carried two helmets with me just in case I ever had to take C home, which I generally did whenever we met. It seemed I'd made her cry, so we took the scenic route back to her house and I dropped her off. I lent her my jacket, so I couldn't stop shaking in the cold, but I almost passed out several times in the bath before I hit the hay. The next day, C called me as I was doing maintenance on my car and bike, and we agreed to meet M two days later. And as for the cave, well, I couldn't rule out that E had maybe been infected by an unknown virus, so I asked my mother, a medical professional, for two N95 masks, including one I would use for a fitting test. Next, I brought some climbing ropes and asked a classmate from high school who was a part of the Coast Guard, as well as a friend who was a firefighter, to help me with tying, how to descend, and how to safely use them. The Coast Guard and firefighters are always busy when regular people have their days off, and it can be deadly if they don't get enough sleep, so we called it a day quite early. I'd never spoken to M before, but she had no doubt grown into a beautiful woman, so I was excited to meet her. In fact, I was so excited that I showed up to the meeting in brand new clothes I bought just the day before. With a new haircut, of course. Rather than my well-worn cargo pants or oil-stained jeans. I arrived five minutes early, and C approached with a smile as she saw my car. Eh? C's here? I'm not meeting Emma alone. Although, I have no idea what she looks like now, I thought. I got out of the car to greet her, and she gave me the once-over before turning a cold eye. An unexpectedly beautiful, reserved-looking woman approached behind C. It was M. Huh. You sure are going all out for this, aren't you? C said coldly, and without greeting. But I ignored her, and went to greet M. We decided to head somewhere else to talk first, so I told C to get in the back. You're the third wheel here today, so you sit back there, I said. I don't mind sitting in the back, M replied. Excuse me, she said as she stepped in. What a fine, feminine and virtuous woman she was. C glared at me as she got in. We were classmates, so do you mind if I call you M-chan? I asked. Sorry it's so small back there. It's mostly for emergencies, but there is a seatbelt. We then set off. She wanted to avoid people, so we went to a restaurant on the outskirts of town we reserved beforehand. M seemed a little nervous, so we ate while we talked. So, my boss at the coffee shop asked me if I had a passport, and when I said I did, the following year he sent me to America for three years. He wanted me to rebuild one of the departments over there, but I couldn't even speak English. When I got there and someone spoke to me, suddenly the only thing I could spit out was, How much? <laughs> I said. Even I was surprised, C replied. You're even worse at English than I am. You studied for TOEIC the year before you left and only got 630 points, right? Shut up. You're the only one who can get a score of 780 like it's nothing without even studying or having been abroad beforehand. But you still came back every summer. When we went to pick him up at the airport, he burst out singing Camp de Hoy, and we all burst out laughing, C said. During his second year, I think it was, he said he was going to return completely Americanized, but his clothes said that he didn't quite understand what that meant. At this point, she finally relaxed and smiled. Emchan, what did you do after graduation? I asked. I worked as a pharmacist at a national hospital for five years, and now I work at my mother's pharmacy. A pharmacist, huh? You must be real smart. I don't know anything about that stuff. Oh yeah, I remember you wrote in our graduation book that you wanted to become a pharmacist. That's pretty cool that your dream came true. On that note, what was it that you wanted to see me about? M's expression became tense. Yes. Are you planning on doing anything soon? I have this feeling that something bad is going to happen to you. 
C was flabbergasted. My heart also started pounding wildly. I hadn't told anyone about the cave yet. Even when I learnt how to use the climbing ropes, it was from classmates I didn't know so well, and I hadn't seen M since our junior high graduation anyway. Eh? Why do you say that? I asked, the shock no doubt showing on my face. You might think I'm strange for saying this, but when I saw you today, I was convinced. Of what? Say it. I'll decide whether you're a weirdo or not after I hear it. Don't make that decision for me. If she was going to say something about the cave, I didn't want C to hear it, so I handed her the keys and told her that I'd call for her once we were done. She wasn't very happy about that. If I just say it, then it probably won't make much sense, so let me explain from the beginning, Em said. When I was just a child, I could see and sense spirits attached to people. Some of these spirits looked so unbearable that I gradually started to avoid them. And that's why you avoided me too, huh? Hearing it in her own words made me start to think she might be a little out there. If she started talking about previous lives and such, then that would seal the deal. Well, the spirits following you were so powerful that I was afraid. Eh? Your guardian spirits. There's a female Kamisama, a great warrior from the Edo period, and a white horse, Em said. I'd never seen anything like it before, and I didn't know how they were connected to you either. Huh? <laughs> Hang on a minute. A female Kamisama, a great warrior, and a white horse. Can you draw the woman's face? I asked. And she did. That's my grandmother, although I've only ever seen a portrait of her. It's the same as the picture hanging at a shrine near the house I lived in before elementary school. A military commander built it in honour of a Kamisama, and after he died he was enshrined in several places. That was one of them. There was a picture of a white horse there too. My grandmother passed away when my father was still in school, and the priest said it was dedicated to her. Is that so? Em said. Then perhaps it is your grandmother watching over you. Hmm, alright. I'll believe you on that front. We moved around the time I started elementary school, so all of that happened before I got to know C. Both my parents worked, so I would play and nap on those shrine grounds when I was lonely. It was somewhat calming. I did wonder if I might stumble across a curse there, but... I never thought I was actually being protected, I said. A few weeks ago, your guardians appeared in my dreams and told me to stop you. They were so powerful that of course I remembered you. And that's why you contacted C, who's been my friend since childhood. So, what was it that you were convinced of today? I asked. That your guardian spirits were saying not to go near that place. She didn't say specifically what she meant, but it seemed she was talking about the incident with E. Since C was waiting, we exchanged contact information and then agreed to meet again during Golden Week before leaving the restaurant. On the drive back, C said something strange when she heard we were talking about guardian spirits. Oh yeah, not long after you moved in next door, you disappeared right in front of our eyes one day. Huh? What the hell does that mean? Both M and I said. What? You don't remember? A, B, D, E and I were walking down this road one day and you were on the other side. A and E called out and you ran out just as a car came zooming by. We thought it was going to hit you, but then you just... weren't there. We were shocked, but then you appeared right in front of us, smiling, C said. I don't remember that, but there's no way. That road is a busy three-lane road. That's where the old lady who used to live behind us died during the autumn of our first grade of elementary school. There's no crossing, and so she tried to cross and got hit, right? And how on earth am I supposed to just disappear in the first place? It's true, C said. 
We all talked about leaving you out of the group because you might be dangerous. But E said you should stay because you were funny. And A felt responsible because he brought you to us when you met at the park. And the older two decided you should stay. But for a while after that, I was kind of afraid of you. Well, setting aside whether I actually disappeared or not, so that's why you ignored me at first. Huh. I remember when I asked you to walk home with me one day and you completely ignored me and went home alone. I could see your back from 30 meters away and you seemed so far away. I feel like B and D also kept their distance as well, I said. I'm sorry, C replied. That all happened over 20 years ago now, so please don't blame me. Now I really like you a lot. Please refrain from saying things that could be misunderstood in public. Are you two dating by any chance? Em asked. You seem to get along quite well. Well, she ignored me at first. Oh, come on. Oh yeah, I love the ice cream they have here, so I'll go get some for you guys, I said. What about yourself? C asked. I just want a bite, so I'll buy it and just let me have a bit, okay? I went to get some ice creams and then had a bite. Come to think of it, when did we become good friends? I said. Third grade? When we went camping that year, you did something stupid and broke your leg, but that's about all I remember. Yeah, it was around that time. I was taking a break by the stream as we were climbing the mountain, and as I tried to jump across it, I slipped and broke my leg. Everyone even tried to stop me first. They were talking about whether they should go get my dad, and you were like, that'll take too long, I'll take her back to camp myself. Then you carried me all the way back. You were smaller than me then, but you still carried me for a whole hour. When I asked if you were okay, you said, I'm a swordsman, so this is fine. Even in the car, you said, let me, and put your hand on the broken spot, and surprisingly, the pain went away. Ah, yeah, I remember that, I said. You were crying about your back hurting, but then you returned to camp with a cast on your leg. <laughs> I never thought you more of a dude than in that moment. You put your hand on her leg to heal her, Em asked. Yeah. It wasn't anything special. I saw it on TV once. They put their hands on a sick person and the pain suddenly stopped. Like, it promotes natural healing or something. I've heard that women's hands are especially strong after childbirth. They're still studying why. Wait, Emchan, he just called me a dude. Can you believe that? When I became a model, he was like, you must have photoshopped your headshot. Or, you paid the money, didn't you? Even though it was them who scouted me. And when I appeared in a magazine, he said, What kind of animal guide is this? He called me an animal. That's awful, Em agreed. Right? Ah, what was he like in junior high? Mm, he was still playing tag in the second grade. I saw him jump off the second floor veranda whilst being chased once. The kids in the other classes were all shocked by the kid chasing him was just like, damn it, he did it again. Like, he always did that. But then we had a full school assembly just before the summer holidays and we were banned from jumping off the verandas. What are you? A monkey? C said. Another time? There was a quiet kid who was being bullied, but then T went up to the bullies and said, Starting today, he's my friend, so if you have any business with him, then you have business with me too. After that, the bullies were missing from school for a week. What happened? M turned her question to me. I was just a stupid kid, sorry. I asked them to meet after school and then I beat them up. I went with the teacher and my parents to apologise after that, but it was five against one, and with things being how they were, well, they didn't blame me. You've always hated bullies, huh? C said. 
Even if it has nothing to do with me, if I see it, it pisses me off. I've done kendo since I was a kid, so I'm well versed in beating those stronger than me. What the hell is so fun about picking on someone weaker than you anyway? I said. M-chan, C continued, do you know the light of life? The what now? I heard about this from my friends A and E once before, but it's something T once said. What does it mean? About six months after he got his license, he said that he learnt this great new trick, and so he went up into the mountains with A and E. They were wondering what he was going to do, and apparently he covered the front and side windows with sunshades, and then drove using only the car navigation. A said he was scared, but E figured that it was something you could do if you practiced enough. Then, as he was driving, T said something like, Don't run on the road. And then after turning to go back, he suddenly slammed on the brakes. When they asked him why he stopped, he said an animal ran across the road. They got out of the car and, apparently, there was a tanuki. When they asked how he knew an animal was there, he said he saw the light of life. You have too much power, M said. I don't know if I'd call it that, I said, but you make it sound like there's a downside to it. I've never seen anyone affected by their guardian spirits this much before. It makes me wonder if there is perhaps some price you'll have to pay in return. A price to pay? Well, if it's really that strong, then maybe I'll die once it disappears. <laughs> eh? Both ladies said in unison. See, you know that I used to go to the hospital every year for a heart checkup until I was 10, right? Well, did you know that I once died from Kawasaki disease when I was only three months old? I couldn't drink milk, so I was getting weaker and weaker and could do nothing but lay there full of tubes. I heard that my heart stopped and my mother revived me before the doctors even arrived. I still have a scar on my thigh from where they put the camera to check my heart. I don't know if it was a dream or not, but I was alone in a field and an old woman I didn't know was there. I felt comfortable with her, so I tried to approach her, but then she gently said, You mustn't come this way. Wait right there for your mother and father. And then she left. I remembered what happened when I was a child, and when I saw a picture of my grandmother, I was like, Ah, oh, it's her! I had memories of her, so I thought she died after I was born, but turned out she died while my father was still a student. Are you saying she revived you? Em asked. Maybe. Hearing what you had to say today, I can kind of understand now why I've always been so lucky. Although, it's not very scientific, so I can't say I'm a big fan. I thought that if I continued talking to Em, then she might sway my decision to go to the cave. So, when we parted ways, I cancelled our next get-together. As we said goodbye to M, C started crying. I don't want you to die, she said, and I had to calm her down a bit before we went home. I had everything ready to go, so although it was a little soon, I decided I'd return to my own place. The cave exploration has started to feel real now, and the warning bells are going off even louder in my head. Even as I write this, the fear of the unknown is overwhelming me. Sorry for writing down all this conversation that dragged on. I'm trying to overcome my fear. Judging by what happened to E, it's impossible to return from that cave he visited. I keep telling myself that the reason I'm growing more fearful is because I now know why the alarm bells keep going off. The next time I return to my parents' house will be during the Obon holidays. My biggest worry is whether I'll be able to flip the switch and concentrate on my work until then. This is B, and this is the follow-up to my friend in the tape 3. I'm submitting what T wrote in the summer of 2012 in his stead. I visit the pharmacy M Charm works at every week just to see her. She is beautiful beyond words. 
the Bond holidays of 2012. I had gotten used to ignoring the warning bells ringing in my head since before Golden Week, but the time to finally make a decision was getting closer. One year had passed since E's death. I couldn't just let things end without understanding why. I designed and installed a one-off intake manifold and exhaust manifold, replaced the throttle and turbine and reset the ECU in my car. It was quieter, more powerful and more fuel efficient. I then drove back to my parents' house. This time, I would be staying there for a whole week. My schedule was rather packed. First day was a party. Second and third days, I'd visit the cave. The fourth, fifth and sixth days, we'd go camping. And then, on the seventh day, I would return home. Feeling more energetic than usual, I was still quite alert when I arrived back home. So I lit some incense for E, then told him my plans. I'm sorry I never listened to you, but I'm going to see for myself. Suddenly, the vase in his altar fell over, and the incense broke. If you're E, then don't worry about me. If you're my guardians, then shut up and watch over me. That was how I felt in the moment, and then I left his house. I had a fitting test with the masks I asked my mother for before the party, and I regretted being a cheapskate and not asking for N100s instead. I loaded my car with a sleeping bag, stove, hatchet, crowbar, climbing rope, portable stove, food, water, lantern, folding shovel, with a pickaxe, and the masks. I was ready to go. I decided I'd take my bike to the party, like always, and took C's helmet with me. When I got there, D gave me a strange Buddha statue as a souvenir, but the moment I grabbed it, the head fell off. I picked it up and put it in my pocket. Where on earth did he go? You're about to do something, aren't you? D suddenly said. Once again, he saw right through me. Well, it is my job as manager. I can't live like I'm one of the low-level employees, I said covering it up with work talk. He looked like he wanted to say something, but then my phone rang. C wanted me to pick her up. Her mother stopped me when I arrived at their house. We were in the middle of our get-together, but still she invited me in for tea and snacks. And C wasn't even ready yet. When I was done catching up with her mother, C was finally ready to go. And once we were all together, we got to talking about the camp. We've found a great place for this year's camp, I said. Where? D asked. It's got a hot spring, A replied. For real? It's about a two hour walk from the car though, A continued. T sent me a message with the coordinates and asked me to check it out. How did you find it? B asked. I like little known hot springs, I replied. You can find them on topographical maps. Often they're dried up, but if someone brings a shovel, we can dig a bath. Hey, you remember a girl from high school called F, right? D suddenly said. Do you mind if I bring her along? Ah, the girl from D's class with the big... Yeah, sure, okay. We then went home for the night, everyone excited that we now had another lady joining us. But before taking C home, we did our now customary pillow change. This became a regular thing around the time I left home to go to university. They took my pillow when I first moved out, but when I told them that put me in a bad spot, they said I should just bring a regular pillow that I used for half the year. Thankfully, they returned them after being cleaned. I took C back home and then got my fluffy pillow. As I turned the lights off and got into bed, I saw the shadow of a person in my old TV that I used to use. The power cord was sitting on the top of it. These sorts of warning signs had been popping up a lot in recent weeks, but I tried to ignore them and went to sleep. Game day, 4am. I left a note on the table. I'll be back tomorrow night, probably. I stopped my car in the parking lot and then looked for the entrance to the abandoned road. 
The area about a metre from the road was overgrown with weeds, but it looked passable after that, so I decided to drive in. I did a U-turn partway in, and then reversed. Using the rearview camera, I checked the path on the screen, and a section of the road about 50 centimetres wide had been wiped away from flooding, so I stopped the car. I got out and noticed so much soil had settled that it buried the guardrails. This made it hard to tell, but it seemed I'd arrived at the bridge. I'd lose my car if the bridge collapsed, so I moved it back off and then went down towards the river. According to what E wrote, I had to follow the river for about 20 minutes, but I reached the top of the waterfall in 15. I took out the climbing rope and then descended. The cave really was there. Seeing it with my own eyes, it looked bigger than I expected. I washed my face in the clear water and then sighed. I was finally here. 12 p.m. I settled in front of the cave and unpacked. I gathered some firewood for that night, cleaned up, put on the mask, and then went into the cave. As E said, the back of the cave looked like natural rock from the entrance, but up close, it was made of crumbling bricks. This was the right place. My excitement grew. I reached the back room and checked the altar. Although it looked man-made, there were no signs it had been carved out. I examined the sarcophagus, careful not to touch it, but I couldn't see any joints anywhere. If there had been a lid, then I could have used my crowbar to open it. I used my knife to try to cut a piece off so I could examine what it was made of, but I couldn't cut anything off. I hit it with the crowbar, and it sounded hollow. What else could I do? I hit it as hard as I could to try to make a hole. The tip shattered with the first blow. If it was something physical that killed E, then I had to keep my mask on to examine the inside. But if it was something spiritual, like M said, then there was no way my guardian spirits would stay quiet. Regardless of which it was, I was ready. As the one metre crowbar started to reach its limit, there was a crack and the hole finally opened. The moment I went to peer inside, something hazy floated out of it. At the same time, I heard what sounded like a scream and my vision flickered. I was so dizzy that I could no longer stand and I fell down against the sarcophagus. You fool! I told you to stop! In my daze, I heard an angry voice and then I passed out. I don't know how long I was out for, but eventually I woke up. I had no energy and was racked by chills, and the alarm bells that had been ringing since before Golden Week were gone. There was nothing like the voices E mentioned in his logs though. My mind was remarkably clear. This was different to what E said. Was it over? I crawled outside, took my mask off, and took a deep breath finally able to get some air, but being unable to stand up at the same time, I let out a bitter laugh. The sun was setting. The clock on my phone said it was just after 6pm. I made a fire and cooked some blocks of meat, and then I boiled some water for coffee. The food gave me a little strength back, and then I set my alarm for 9pm and got into bed. Before 11pm, The alarm awoke me up and I had regained some strength. I added more wood to the fire so it wouldn't go out and then went back into the cave. I looked inside the sarcophagus, but it was empty. I touched it, but nothing happened. Putting some pieces that had chipped off into a case, I retrieved the now bent crowbar and then left. In order to seal the room, I would have to tie the ropes into a pulley system to move some large rocks. By the time I was done, it was morning. I cleaned all traces that I had been there, and then went back to my car. As soon as I sat down, I burst into tears of both relief and accomplishment. When I reached an area where I could get phone service again, I got several messages. I pulled over to check. They were from M and C. 
Starting from 1.30 the day before, she sent five messages every few hours. They all said the same thing. Please contact me. I'd sent her a few messages and spoken on the phone a few times since Golden Week, but she'd never sent such short, brief messages like this before. What happened? What did you do? She kept saying when I called her. Look, I'll come see you soon. It'll take me about three hours, I said politely and made my way towards her pharmacy. When I got there, she was waiting in a white coat. She rushed over to me with a surprised look on her face. Why is your grandmother the only one here? Huh? Exactly what I said. Why is your grandmother the only guardian spirit here? And what's wrong with your face? I was born with it? Sorry I'm not that good looking. That's not what I mean. Don't you feel sick? You're so pale. Can you stand? When I got out of the car, I fell to my knees. The image of a man falling to his knees in front of a beautiful woman was so embarrassing that I could have died. No, I can't, I said, and M went back into the store before returning with her mother. They carried me to their house out the back. Oh, wait, I have to move the car, I said, but M stopped me. I'll do it. I drive a manual, so it's fine. Ah, you left it running, so that's why you're worried, she said, and then ran towards the car. Hey, wait, I tried to scream. Em's mother and I waited in silence as various bangs and crashes came from the direction of my car. Is everything okay? I said, trying to rush over, but I fell back down again. Could I look any more pathetic? Em's mother ran to the rescue. While things weren't exactly okay, she managed to stop the car right by the edge of the wall. She looked pale after having her first accident. I'm so sorry, she apologised, but I asked her to start the engine again so I could at least check it. There was no sound of compression leakage, so it seemed to be okay. After checking everything else, it seemed perfectly fine. It would still run. At a glance, the bumper looked like it was going to fall off, but some tie wraps would hold it over. M didn't appear to be injured, and I refused to call the police about it or take money for the repairs. Then we went inside the house. M's mother put out some bedding in the guest room, and I sat down on it. I also refused the hospital because I had plans to go shopping for our camping trip that evening. M's mother, who was very apologetic, told me she was happy I was so concerned about her and M rather than the condition of my car, and then went back to the pharmacy, which she had left open. M, meanwhile, curled up and was about to cry. Our conversation was going nowhere. I laid down, sleeping after being on the move all night. Have you ever heard of the Buddhist saying, all worldly things are transitory? There's something similar in the tale of Heike, The sound of Gion Shoja bells echoes the impermanence of all things. All things will eventually break. It just happened to be today, so don't worry about it. And it still works just fine, I said. But there's a difference between something breaking and breaking something yourself. Your car is important to you, isn't it? Em said. I felt myself getting angry. It wasn't like you did it on purpose, was it? But look, I'm going to go to sleep, so in exchange, you can hold my hand. Then we'll call it even. I fell asleep immediately, like three seconds after the conversation was done. I woke up feeling something strange on my face. Em's face was right next to mine, surprising me. Not to mention, she was looking right at me. It was honestly kind of scary. I didn't ask her to actually lie down with me, but at any rate, we continued the conversation. Apparently, the two figures and one animal that were my guardian spirits had apparently reduced to just one, my grandmother. 
and her power was also weakening and she was on the verge of disappearing. The other figure and the animal were also greatly weakened, so they had probably returned to the shrine to recuperate, she said. But they weren't disconnected from each other. Something like a thin umbilical cord connected them all. She also said that because they existed through people's faith and the number of worshippers had decreased in recent times, it would probably take them even longer to recover. Also, because their power and my power was proportionate, I was now weaker than the average person. I would later feel the terrible effects of this during the camp. But basically, M could no longer make contact with the Guardian spirits and the information she was receiving was apparently only one way, so the best she could do was guess from that. Why are they sending you this information? I asked. Because when I saw them in the second grade, they realised I could see them too, she said. The reason she messaged me the day before was apparently because of my grandmother as well. She then said she could sense something strange in my car, and got out of bed so she could take a look at the pieces of sarcophagus that I brought back. I could stand. I felt perfectly fine. I looked at the clock, and it was 1pm. Apparently, I had been asleep in their house for four hours. I laughed at how shameless I was, and wondered if perhaps the bed was hot. Em's blouse was covered in sweat, and her face red. She kind of looked like a combination of Evergreen from Dark Shadows and Kawakita Mayuko from Hitori Kakurembo. You can let go of my hand now, I said, but she replied that she was unsure if I'd fall down again. I thanked her mother, returned to the car, checked the mirror to see if the colour was returning to my face, and then took the case out. The pieces were gone. It was a waterproof case with a lock that could be used for diving. There was no way the contents could just disappear. M said she could sense something coming from it as well, but because it had disappeared, she couldn't tell anything more than that. We were both stunned. M's mother then suggested the three of us have lunch together. We hadn't even introduced ourselves by that point, so we did just that. I told her that we grew up in the same school district, but only recently had become friends. I heard, M's mother said with an elegant smile. M has looked very happy when she speaks of it lately. After lunch, I borrowed M's charger to charge my dead phone, then sent C a message. I need to fix my car, so help me out. If you're free, then come get me. Her dad was going to pick me up in his car. Before hanging up, M took the phone and told C all sorts of things she didn't need to, like how she caused the accident and how I couldn't even stand up. Before leaving, I told M to call me if anything happened and, even if there was nothing wrong, to just give me a call once in a while anyway. Then I returned home. This is B, and this is the follow-up to my friend in the tape 4. I'm submitting what T wrote in the summer of 2012, before he collapsed, in his stead. The 2012 Obon holidays. After exploring the cave and after M crashed my car. It started on the afternoon of the third day after that. I dropped by M's pharmacy to tape up the bumper that was falling off, and then returned to my parents' house. I was preparing my tools to fix it when C arrived. I tended to do the work myself, but it's easier when I have an assistant who I can just say stuff like, drill, tie wrap, to as well. Twenty minutes passed and I started joking around with C, but then she suddenly confronted me as to why I was at M's place to begin with. I thought that Mentioning the weakening of my guardian spirits would inevitably lead to talk of the cave, so I decided to step around the issue. Still, she refused to give up. Remembering the shrine, I succeeded in getting her in the car instead, 
so we could go for a drive until it was time to go shopping. I also wanted to take the car for a test drive, so I got on the highway and briefly floored it. We arrived at the familiar shrine in only 10 minutes, when it would have taken 40 if we used the bypass. I think this is the first time I've brought you here, I said. I live nearby, so I often came here. This is the only place around here that never changes. You know, if you pray for something here, it will come true. I prayed for friends that would always be by my side, and then I met you guys. First I prayed, and then sat on a pine tree I always used to climb as a kid and looked around. The area was surrounded by apartments, and the bypass was nearby. But the air in this area was clean and fresh. Everything was exactly the same as when I was a child. It was like nothing had changed at all. Why was there only one pine tree in the shrine grounds, and why did it grow sideways? I always wondered that. Growing more and more nostalgic, I walked over to see who was still praying and stood beside her. As a child, I could only ring that bell by grabbing the rope with both hands, but now I could ring it with just one. It made me realise just how much I'd grown. I loved the sound of that bell and always used to ring it for like 10 minutes straight. Looking closer, I could see a repair mark on it now. I put all the cash I had on hand into the donation box, hoping that it would help the poor shrine that had few followers and maybe help protect me as well. Please remain just as you are now, I prayed. Although, if I remember correctly, that shrine was a cultural asset, so it wasn't like it would be going anywhere. And once I was done praying, my shoulders suddenly seemed much lighter. C said she wanted to see the house I was born in, but it had long since been rebuilt into an apartment that was being rented out. Still, she insisted. It was about a five minute walk from the shrine, and on the way, I bumped into a neighbour I hadn't seen in roughly 25 years. Oh my, you've grown up splendidly, she said, and seemed surprised at how little I'd changed since I was a child. We got back in the car and C drove us to the supermarket where we were planning to meet up with everyone. I fell asleep on the way and when I woke up, I was surrounded by everyone who was going camping with us. I got out of the car to go shopping, but everyone kept a slight distance from me. As I suddenly caught a glimpse of myself in the window, something seemed off about my face. Looking closer, there were eyes drawn on my eyelids, a fake beard, and swirls on my cheeks. Oh, come on, guys. This is oil-based, isn't it? And... What's with this writing? The characters for inside and meat were scribbled on my forehead. Everyone burst into laughter. A woman holding a bag on the other side of the glass suddenly looked at me in surprise. A handed me a mask and sunglasses, and then we went inside to do our shopping. There it was. I looked just like a weird old guy trying to hide his face with strange words written on his head. As the others argued over what to buy, I'd removed the mask and sunglasses as people walked by and made my own fun. C caught me a few times and warned me. They'll call the police on you, you know. I went back to the car to get my stuff and asked someone if I could stay at their place for the night. I could hardly return to my parents' house looking the way I did. Both A and C said yes. So we had dinner at C's house, and then I decided to stay at A's house for the night. Nice to see you again, sir, A and I said when we saw C's father, and he quickly took note of my face. It's the latest fashion, I joked as I pushed past him. There was still a bit of time until dinner was ready, so I took a shower. I wondered why the shower room, which was separate to the bath, was separated by glass. Odd. The bottom part was frosted glass, so I was standing there, swinging my hips around like a stripper, when A suddenly came in. 
Well, that was certainly awkward. I'll pretend I didn't see that, he said. When I returned to the living room, C's father apologised to me. I asked him why, and apparently the writing on my face was C's idea. She just started drawing, and next thing she knew, everyone had gathered around. Be grateful she didn't colour in your front teeth, A said. When I told him I didn't care because I personally couldn't see it, they smiled bitterly in return. On the way to A's house after dinner, he reminisced. We also drew on your face during junior high, didn't we? Not long after we started junior high, I fell asleep at B's house, and then he, A, D, and E took my clothes off and drew hairs all over me. I was still a hairless kid who wished to be an adult at the time, so I added a happy trail myself and then posed for them all. But then B's mother came in with some tea and saw me. When A's parents saw my face, we told them they were just imagining things, and then we went to bed. The fourth day of the Obon holidays. Finally, it was time for our once-a-year camping trip, the thing I always looked forward to the most. We went in two separate cars, A's and D's. F and D wanted to be alone in D's car, so the rest of us went in A's. B sat in the passenger seat while... C sat in the right rear seat, and I in the left. You've been sleeping quite a bit lately. Are you feeling unwell? A suddenly asked me on the drive over. Ever since high school, you've made it a habit to never sleep more than three hours a night, right? But this morning I could barely get you up at all. Yeah, I've been worried too, C chimed in. M Chan said you were too tired and to let you sleep but you slept for more than an hour in the car yesterday. Normally, if I make a wrong turn on the way somewhere, you'll wake up and say something like, turn right at the next light. Hearing that, it suddenly hit me. Ever since I started my job, I made it a habit to only sleep three hours a night, and then 15 minutes during lunch. The rest of my time, I used to study and work on myself. I'd been living like this for 15 years, so I was quite used to it. But ever since I destroyed the sarcophagus, I slept four hours at the cave, three that night, then four hours at M's house, one hour in C's car, and six hours at A's house, for a total of 18 hours sleep in 42 hours. I don't know. Ever since yesterday, I just fall asleep once I let go, I said and then soon fell asleep again. Was this in reaction to the loss of support from my guardian spirits? We arrived at the parking area near the campgrounds and got our stuff out of the car. There would be nowhere for us to get food nearby, so we had a lot of food and drinks with us. Normally, I would carry the heaviest stuff and joke about the others getting me a drink in return, but this time around, I wasn't strong enough to do it. Usually, I could lift up to twice my body weight without any sort of prep. I tried to stand with a load on my shoulder, but there was no strength in my legs. Seems he's not feeling too well today, A said to D, who looked confused. A, B, and then D took turns carrying the heavy stuff instead. I grabbed my stuff and two tents, and then we made our way towards the campgrounds. After a two-hour walk through the mountains, we reached the campsite. We quickly found a spot to pitch our tents and put three up, then asked D and F to find some firewood while we dug a bath. C wasn't strong enough to help us dig, so we asked her to tie some picnic cheeks together to make an enclosure instead. Because the hot spring source was around 52 degrees, we dug two baths, one warm and one hot, and then two small baths in which we could fully lie down. Then, as I was about to chop the firewood they had brought, F approached me. Hey, you don't look so good, she said. She was D and E's classmate, and after high school, she moved to another prefecture with her family and became a nurse before coming back. D 
E and F all transferred to my school during junior high, which was how I knew them. D and F started dating in high school, but after F moved, he never dated anyone else. Come on, come this way, she said, and pushed me into a tent. She seemed to be checking my pulse on my wrist. Then she made me take my shirt off, and she put an ear to my chest to listen for my heartbeat. Yeah, I said when she saw my chest, but she just got angry at me. Hey, are you okay? She said a few minutes later. I don't have to be a doctor to know this isn't normal. I can't feel a pulse, nor hear your heartbeat. How on earth are you moving? Just tell everyone it's anemia, I said. I'll be fine after I sleep for a bit. Please. When I woke up, C was looking down at me with concern on her face. Seemed dinner was ready and she came to get me. I thanked her and got dressed. What's going on with you? She asked. It's just anemia, I said. There's no way anemia could cause this. Cause what? I asked, and she pointed to the scars all over my body. I looked down to see what she was pointing at. There was the scar I got when I was stabbed with a butterfly knife when I was a rebellious kid out looking for fights, and a cut on my shoulder from when I was stabbed with a broken bottle, both clearly visible in the dim light of the single lantern in the tent. I never paid much attention to them before because both healed cleanly within three days after applying a bandage. C and I were such good friends that we could take baths together, so I knew it would be impossible to hide anything from her. I'll tell you later, I said. For now, let's just enjoy our trip. Then I left the tent. Dinner was gyoza, F's specialty. There was shiso, cheese, and crunchy plum, all nostalgic flavours for me. After dinner, we gathered around the fire while A played guitar. This was also a tradition for us. He could play anything like a jukebox, other than recent J-pop, but if he listened to a song just twice, then he could play it. I requested Teaching Myself to Dream and Moonlight Shadow, and asked C to sing. Do that thing from the live, B then said to me. That thing happened during our second grade of high school. Some of my friends from school and some of our friends from C school formed a band, and to cover for something that happened during our live performance, I did a little ad-libbing. Sure, C said. I was a little embarrassed, so I refused, and then A, B, and C explained to F what happened. E was there at the time too. C was on vocals and I played drums alongside two others. We took part in a small life performance at a music store where four groups played five songs each. We were set to play fourth. Everything went fine up until the fourth song, but then, once the fifth song started, nobody sung. We played the prelude over and over, as though waiting for someone to sing. At the end of the second time around, the guests and other band members noticed something was wrong and people started to mutter. This must be the last song, right? I looked at C, who seemed to be panicking, and realised she must have forgotten the lyrics. So I decided to ad-lib. I stopped playing and approached her, singing A Whole New World from Aladdin. During the Or Say We're Only Dreaming part, I kissed the back of C's hand and pretended we were singing a duet. If C didn't join in with some perfectly timed lyrics, then it would have been a cold, cold world. Everyone in the audience clapped, but I saw the woman running the event was crying. I went to apologise for singing a ballad at a rock event, but unexpectedly, she praised us. Most of the women in the audience were crying, weren't they? B said. We visited the video store next door after, and all the copies of Aladdin were gone, <laughs> A said. My head just went blank and I was like, well, this is it, C said with a laugh. 
That's just like you, Dee said. Why did you sing Aladdin, though? F asked. And in English, even. I mean, I thought it was a bit on the nose, but it was the only song I could think of at the time to buy time for the male part, and I figured C would be able to go along with it as well, I replied. Why didn't you just sing a song by yourself? She asked again. She was in such a state of shock that her eyes were unfocused, so I figured it would traumatize her if I just left her there like that, and so I made her sing as well. Huh, so you were thinking about her as well. As F asked me all sorts of questions, she was acting like a big sister, which is a little scary, C suddenly stood up and started singing, Tale as Old as Time. Beauty and the Beast. I suddenly joined her for just a little change. And just like that, I got out of F's grilling. Let's fade out into the baths after this song, she whispered. And then we escaped. After having my back washed, I soaked in the water and stared at the starry sky above. Suddenly I remembered that we hadn't divided the tents yet. Would it be D and F? B and C, and then A and me, or C and F, A and D, and B and me. I wasn't sure what to expect. I found A, B, D, and F drinking around the fire. That's your tent, B said, and I went inside to find C lying down. Ah, my bad, wrong tent, I said, and went back out. Which tent is mine again? I asked and they pointed to the same tent once more. Well, I didn't mind sleeping with C, so I went back in again and laid down. Fifth day of the Obon holidays. I woke up first, so I made breakfast for everyone and sandwiches for lunch. Everyone planned on going for a walk around the area, but I intended to go back to bed. If I passed out while everyone was walking, then I'd just cause more trouble for them. I keenly felt what M said about me working at less than normal capacity now. As I was making a shade cloth for the bath, C came to tell me that everyone was awake. I went back and we all ate together. As we were eating, I told everyone that I would stay behind, so C said she would remain as well. Something bad might happen if you're alone, so we should avoid doing anything by ourselves, F said. And so, the decision was made. C and I saw the other four off, and while she washed the plates, I took a bath. I put my arms and legs out and soaked just my torso in the hot water. In this position, I could lay in the water for hours and not have all the blood rush to my head. Drinking some barley tea, I also had my first cigarette in a while. I tried not to smoke in front of non-smokers, other than C., so it was my first one since the cave. D and I, as well as E, were the only ones of us childhood friends who smoked. Suddenly writing about what happened during the Obon holidays felt like I was writing a diary. The laptop I carried around in private didn't have any power. Oh well, and I'd be lying if I said that writing short, easy-to-understand sentences was easy for me someone who was a science major. If it were a thesis or report, then I could write it like I was doing my job. Let's just write down my experiences and thoughts. Thinking that everything I wrote was crap, C suddenly arrived as I was putting down what I thought was the best part. She brought a fan and some barley tea, then sat next to me and wiped the sweat from my forehead as she fanned me. She was great at cooking and incredibly thoughtful. She would make a great wife, I thought, and I wondered if she had any suitors. She was both beautiful and stylish. Wait, if she got married to someone we didn't know, then I'd no longer be able to hang out with her like now. Maybe B really was the right guy for her then. You said yesterday that we'd talk later, right? She said, interrupting my thoughts. So, she remembered. Well, it was only the day before, I guess. Time to just spit it out, right? 
I thought about what I should tell her and what I should keep to myself. Let me start by saying that I can't see them, so I don't know whether this is actually true or not, I said. I then told her about what M said the day before last, regarding my guardian spirit's weakening and how she warned me to take care of my health. In truth, I felt great, but I couldn't seem to stay awake for very long, and I couldn't focus on releasing the energy in my lower abdomen. If you do martial arts, then you'll probably understand what I mean. I should add that once the holidays ended, I planned on having a full body checkup at the doctor. Horseflies soon started to bother me, so I got out of the bath and had an early lunch. I wanted to go back to the tent and use C's legs as a pillow, but she was wearing jeans. Mmm, no thanks, I said, and as I went to blow up a cushion, she changed into hot pants. The height of her legs was just perfect for a pillow. How did you know? I said. We've been friends forever, she replied. I tend to know what you're thinking at all times. We really did have the worst relationship. It's been a long time since I fell asleep like this, I thought, and closed my eyes. Sing something for me, I said. (laughs) You think you're a king or something, she replied. You're so nice, I said, and thoughtful. Back when we were in elementary school, you were bigger than me and rougher than all us dudes. She punched me. But you really have changed. Almost like you changed genders. I've always been a girl, she said, and punched me again. Do you want to take this outside? You're the one who hit me first, I said with a laugh. I got to thinking while I was in the bath. We're old enough now to be getting married and having kids. How much longer are we all going to be able to gather like this? S got married and moved far away, right? And now she has three kids. K left home to go to a university and then got married to a beautiful woman. I also left home for university and then got a job. The number of classmates I'm still close with is getting less and less. Even A, B, D and E, we were all the same age but... Next thing I knew, we were starting to drift apart and do our own things. You've always been there for me, and when I think about how you might not always be there, it makes me sad. Wait, who's going to disappear? C said. You're the one who left first. We were all studying hard for exams, and you were like, I have a recommendation to university, and a scholarship too. I don't have to pay any fees either try to think about how we were feeling. I mean, you did try teaching us, but I couldn't understand what you were saying as I ate rice crackers. Ah, when I used the bonnet of E's car as a whiteboard. Well, thanks to that, everyone got into the university of their choice, didn't they? You were a D student before that, weren't you? During November of our final year, I was like, what the hell? When you said our next lecture was going to be on meditation, (laughs) Well, it's important. You need to visualize how you're going to achieve success and visualize yourself performing to the best of your abilities. You were able to solve problems you couldn't do before that way, weren't you? You can get there yourself without having to memorize formulas and such once you know how it all works. But for the past few days, I haven't been able to visualize myself as a high performer. Before, I could see sparks flying when I meditated, and then I'd get results I was happy with. But now, it's like my head is blank and my body won't move. So my thoughts got a little negative and I got sad thinking that one day you'll get married and move away. And who exactly am I going to marry? I don't think that's possible for me. I wouldn't say that. Around the second grade of high school or so. Honestly, I don't want to admit it, but you started to look real cute then. And now that you've gotten older, you're more beautiful. You're a hard worker, good at housework, you're kind and thoughtful, bright and fun. You're good at singing and the piano as well. You tick all the boxes. You should have more confidence in yourself. 
you can get married whenever you want. You have my seal of approval, so be grateful. My eyes were closed, but I could feel tears falling on my face. Is there someone you like? I asked. There is. Do you think it will go well? No matter what I do, he never looks at me that way, so I thought I'd give up, but maybe I'll try a little harder now. I felt bad for her. There were no other women in the world quite like her. You can do it. Just like Anzai Sensei says, if you give up, then it's over right then and there. How long have your feelings been one-sided? Since third grade. Wow, that was a long time. I felt a little bad for the other person too. It was almost like a curse. And are they with us on this camp? Yes. <gasps> All right. I wouldn't lose any friends this way. What started it all, or rather, is there a reason why you've never said anything all this time? He always helps me out. Always. When I couldn't talk to anyone and felt like everything was falling apart, suddenly he called me. He never called me out of the blue, and when I asked why he called, he said, just because. And when I'm in trouble, he shows up out of nowhere and helps me. What a nice guy. Was it A, maybe? Is that what you were praying so hard for at the shrine? Yes. Then it'll come true. I guarantee it. And if it doesn't happen by the time you turn 35, then I'll marry you. All right. That's a promise. We silently pinky sweared, and then I fell asleep. I woke up to a lot of noise outside. C apparently kept fanning me and wiping my sweat as I slept, because I felt quite comfortable. I thanked her for letting me use her legs as a pillow, and then went outside. I asked what was going on, and they showed me a pheasant they caught. That's a male, I said. It's still alive, so what are you going to do with it? It was forbidden to hunt females. You deal with it, B said. Hey, we already have enough food, don't we? I mean, I'd like to try it, but I don't want to kill it needlessly. You were asleep in the car, so I guess you don't know, huh? B said. We absolutely do not have enough food. There's nothing left in C's cooler, right? You used all the corned beef for sandwiches, so we only have a few vegetables and some rice left. All right, all right, I get it. But why me? Because you were sleeping with C. And well, we can't exactly kill it. C and I said nothing. Well, what else could I do? I told C to stay with everyone else. How was I supposed to do this? What was the order? There were four key points, right? Hang it upside down and hold the wings so they couldn't move. If I didn't pluck the feathers before death, then they would be harder to remove. If I didn't remove the insides right away, then the meat would smell. And its insides were basically the same as a human's, right? Something like that. I grabbed some plastic string, a bucket, newspaper, knife, wire, and a table, and took them to the water's edge. I tied the legs and hung it from the table. The wings were held in place by wrapping newspaper around it like a cone. As it looked at me, it reminded me of the parakeet I used to keep as a pet, and I felt bad. I tried to remember the anatomy charts we used to have when I was a child. There was no way it could be that different to a person, right? I'm so sorry. I apologized in my heart. I won't let you go to waste. I put my hands together in prayer and then covered the bird's eyes with my left hand. It began to thrash as I cut it. I suddenly remembered that humans could live for up to three minutes after having their carotid artery cut, so I apologized again and quickly finished the job. I removed the insides and called A, B, and D once I cleaned up to help remove the feathers. 
It occasionally twitched, scaring A and D. We cleaned everything up and it started to get dark, so we returned to camp. Show some gratitude, I said, and A, C and F quietly put their hands together in prayer. D was off using the toilet. Hey, great job, B said. I was just about to put the knife down, but suddenly I clenched it again. Now's not the time for that, F said and gave B a kick. As expected of our big sister, she understood. B fell backwards in surprise. You can go without until you finally understand, she said, and then returned to cooking. I went past her with the knife in hand and went to the river to wash it. When I came back, I used a stone rather than a sponge to try to get rid of the remaining blood and feeling in my hands when C approached me. She saw blood coming from my hands and embraced me. She felt warm and the strange, unpleasant feeling in my hands disappeared. I watched the wounds on my hands heal in a matter of seconds like watching a tape play in reverse. Hey, you can heal with your hands too, I said to C as I washed away the remaining blood. Why are you here? I asked her. F said that your eyes had been glazed over since dealing with the bird, so I should follow you. Again, as expected of our big sister. When we returned, B was sitting in front of the pot and D was walking around him, chanting something silly and smacking him on the back. It was so stupid that I burst out laughing. Everyone poked at the pheasant as we tried it for the first time and we all agreed. F's cooking was the best. If I had to compare it to something, it was even better than most mother's homemade meals. C was a great cook as well, but this was another level. As I sat down to have a cigarette after dinner, D approached me. You hate killing the most of all, and yet you did it. Well done, he said. When we returned to the campfire, we talked about our winter plans. I said I wanted to go skiing at a hot spring. Aren't you a snowboarder? B asked. I started skiing first. Now I mostly do that and snowboard occasionally. Is there anyone else who can ski other than B? Yeah, you said you used to ski even before you met me. If you teach me how to do it, I'll go too, C said. All right, what about skis? If you want my old ones, I can give you a set with boots and such as well. Sweet, but aren't they expensive? Well, they don't have cute designs on them. Ah, well, you'll have to try the boots on, so you'll have to come over at least once beforehand. I'll come over after work sometime. Can I spend the night? Of course. You can use the bed. It's a double, so we can share. I'll give you a key tomorrow, so come over whenever you want. It's a three-bedroom apartment, but I use them as a hobby, work, and drying rooms. So the bedroom is basically the living room. It might be a little weird, I said. A work room? Everyone said at once. Yeah, I don't have a garage, so I used it to take engines apart and make pieces by myself. You prioritize your hobbies so much that you have nowhere to sleep. That's so like you, Dee said. Just like a happy, rich, single person, F said. No, it's not like that, I said. I get lonely. After living alone for more than 10 years, well, it's hard to go home unless you're surrounded by the things you like. Even now, I often work late because I don't want to go home to an empty house. It's not like I can head out to work from a friend's house at this age. Why don't you look for a girlfriend? B asked. The air suddenly grew tense. I had one before, I said, but she wouldn't treat me as an equal like C. I only seem to date people who treat me like I'm better than them, so we soon break up. I'd rather spend all my time with you guys. I kind of wish time would stop, just like this.
I suddenly realised that what I said was awfully embarrassing and excused myself to go to the toilet. Someone was calling me. It was C's voice. Was she crying? I had to go help her. When I opened my eyes, C was holding me. I had no idea what was going on. I pushed her off me and looked around. A, B, D and F were also crying. I was in front of the baths. My chest hurt. I was beginning to understand what was going on. I collapsed on the way to the baths and F was giving me CPR. I thanked her and tried to stand up when A hit me. Don't scare us like that! A had never hit me before, so I was shocked. It wasn't time that stopped, but your heart. B then screamed and hit me too. What happened? I asked. A and B saw me pass out on the way to the baths. They screamed and ran over to me. They turned me over and checked my airways until F arrived, but I wasn't breathing. She then started CPR and C kept calling my name the whole time. I apologised for the trouble and worry I caused, and promised I'd have a thorough checkup once we got back. A and D then helped me back to my tent. I noticed B's precious video camera lying on the ground by the fire as we passed, and I felt even worse. It seemed things were worse than I thought. I could only stay awake for a short period of time, and perhaps because of stress or injury, I hadn't just passed out, but my heart actually stopped. I had to be very, very careful. The sixth day of the Obon holidays. I woke up and found myself sleeping with C, so I woke her up and we went to take a bath. Someone had opened the sleeping bag before I went to bed and spread it out like a mattress with a blanket. I felt better after getting some sleep. Well, I just didn't realise I wasn't feeling all that well to begin with. Long baths drain you of energy, so we quickly got out once we were done washing each other's backs. As I was getting ready to pack up, B woke up much earlier than usual and told me to sit down. He'd do it for me. How thoughtful of him. People jokingly said that his face was a weapon because of how scary he looked when someone broke up with him, and he actually was a great fighter as well. But deep down, he was a gentle nerd who was a big softy when it came to women. One time, during the summer holidays, he invited me over to his house to watch some dirty videos. C came over, and when he asked her if she wanted to join in, she deleted the data and threw the laptop out the window. She then strangled him and screamed, Don't you show this filthy stuff to T-Chan? Everyone woke up and insisted I sit while they packed up. Thanks, guys. Because I had some time, I wrote down everything that happened the day before. But as I wrote, I realised something. My body was in pretty bad shape. Also, it wasn't that rare for C and I to take a bath together, but then it hit me. Was it really that normal, even for childhood friends of the opposite sex, to still take a bath together when they were adults? I'd been returning home more and more over the last year or so, and even during those times we bathed together, and even slept together in the nude. Well, C kept her underwear on. I'd never seen nor heard about her doing that with any of our other childhood friends. Well, we did grow up next door to each other and saw each other every day, so it was like we were family. Still, it wasn't really appropriate behaviour for someone who was going to get married in the future, so it was about time to stop, huh? Everyone took turns carrying my stuff as we went back down the mountain. I'm sorry for all of this, I said. Friends exist to cause trouble, B replied, so don't worry about it. It was apparently something E, the troublemaker of our group, used to say. I slept again in the car on the way home, and in a daze, I left my laptop in A's car. I'll copy what's in my notebook onto my PC instead. 
C said she wanted to spend the night at my place, so we got out together. I gave her the duplicate key for my apartment that my parents had, and once I was done organising transportation of my car and plane tickets, I laid on a cushion in the living room and fell asleep. When I woke up, my mother was home and making dinner in the kitchen with C. C had learnt to cook from my mother a long time ago, so it was a familiar sight. F sometimes came too. The root vegetables for the soup were frozen overnight so they'd be sweeter, and the meals my mother made were so good, they were like that of a proper restaurant. So much so that when I had something else, it tasted terrible, like an instant meal. My mother always prepared three side dishes for breakfast, and five for dinner. She was very good at what she did. The dishes were laid out naturally, like parent and child. It seemed the laundry that had built up during the holidays was also done and out to dry. I prepared a bed for C in the guest room and then returned to the living room. My father and older brother were there, and the scene was somewhat familiar. But it was like I was the outsider here. After dinner, C did the dishes, and I told my parents that I gave her the duplicate key for my apartment. I returned to my room and saw that not only had she cleaned my bed and vacuumed the floor, but that the dust on all the bookshelves had been wiped off as well. She was, quite simply, too fast. A pro. If only A or B would quickly snatch her up, that would be one less worry on my mind. The seventh day of the Obon holidays. When I woke up, all my stuff was packed and ready to go. It seemed C got up early and even ironed my clothes. I got the used masks out of my car and put them into the transport car. On the way to the airport, I handed them and the sealed case to a former classmate who was a researcher at university. I asked him to examine the masks and case to see if there was any strange bacteria or something attached. He wasn't exactly a blabbermouth, but I asked him to keep quiet about it because it could be dangerous, then slipped him 300,000 yen. Since I was seated opposite the cabin attendant on the flight, I decided to ask them some questions about the plane. One of them handed me a card with a phone number on it, remarking on how I seem to like planes so much, but I was just trying to kill time and there was no way I could bother them in their private time. Once I got home, I charged the batteries on my bikes, called C and my parents, and then went straight to bed. End of August. I stayed overnight at the hospital for a full checkup. End of September. The results from the hospital were great. They said that counselling could help with the long hours of sleep, but because I destroyed the sarcophagus without contacting the research institute, as I should have, I couldn't say anything about the cave. And supposing that E's death had something to do with how I felt, then the symptoms should have shown up much sooner. If there was anything new on that mask I asked my classmate to check, then I hoped they would figure it out soon. I sent an email to C and B, showing them the test results were good. I didn't want to worry C, who was usually so innocent and yet steadfast, like a sunflower. She was the type who dwelled on things, so I hoped that she had somebody nearby who would look after her. I felt like A or B said they'd look after her at the camp, so I was probably worrying over nothing. Start of October. I got a call from the friend I asked to look at the mask and case. After doing a culture test, all he found was regular airborne bacteria. There was no dust or anything else noteworthy. The truth behind the red haze E saw, as well as the voices, remained unknown. But there was still so much we didn't know about this whole case, like the disappearing fragments of the sarcophagus. As soon as I feel better, I'll go back to that cave again with some guys in the archaeology course. I still know where it is, and if it poses a threat or something happens to me, I'll delete all data except for the diary that doesn't specify its location so that no one can visit it. 
C called and said she'll be here around the middle of October. I'll have to get things ready. I don't care if this doesn't connect well with the previous posts. I can't rest, so I'm just going to put it all down without any editing. And that was the end of what T wrote. Two days later, he passed out and was taken to the hospital. This is B, and this is the postscript to the My Friend in the Tape series. Well, I guess it's more of an after that than an actual postscript. One year and nine months have passed since T started writing. I read what he left behind numerous times. I've known him for many years, and reading what he wrote, I think I finally understand the source of T's abnormalities after M came into the picture. About T. This is what I heard from his mother. After the Obon holidays, he was apparently okay, but not in the best health. He visited the hospital for some tests, but they were unable to find anything wrong with him, so he went back to work as usual. But one day in October, he didn't show up to work and there was no notice that he would be away, so his supervisor went to visit his house during his lunch break. He found T collapsed in the doorway, wearing his work suit, so he was quickly rushed to a hospital close to his workplace. He was wearing a different coloured shirt to the previous day, so it was likely he passed out that morning. They conducted various tests, but they were unable to find out what was wrong with him as he continued to lie in a coma. He was then transferred to a local hospital, T was put on leave from work, but it wasn't until a year later that he finally woke up. He'd been in a coma for so long that his father decided to end his job in the meantime. C and M went to visit him almost every day while he was in the hospital. M's mother also went to see him numerous times as well. But perhaps what was most confusing for him was waking up with almost no memories and having people like M, C, and some young nurses and the like tell him that they were his girlfriend and they were engaged to be married. He was terribly confused, and while his mother said she appreciated the fact that they all liked her son, lying to him wasn't a good idea. I heard all this when we went to the hospital to cover his bills. Apparently he had tens of millions of yen in stocks and savings, as well as other insurance policies with his mother as a beneficiary, so he had more than enough to cover things by himself. The following information now comes from me personally. I also went to visit T in the hospital, and I saw C and M wiping him down as he slept. I was so jealous. M worked at her parents' pharmacy, so she could easily visit him during the day. But C quit being a model and was working for a design company, so she could only visit him in the evenings. Even after he woke up, T needed a lot of rehabilitation, even for simple things such as eating. Things seemed even harder than when he was in a coma, but whenever I went to see him, either M, C or his mother was always there with him. As everyone showed him photos and talked to him of the past, gradually his memory started to return, and now he's staying at his parents' place again. Once he got back home, while his memory wasn't perfect, he was still able to destroy everyone academically. At the moment, it appears most of his memories have returned, and he was offered a job in the development wing of a large company, starting April 2015. According to various acquaintances, T is so good at what he does that he's rather famous in the industry. It's kind of hard to believe that he makes the most money when he has such a large, empty spot in his career history. Now that he's back with his parents, us childhood friends hang out a lot more again, and he's someone rather important to all of us. And when I went to visit him in the hospital... I was successful in asking M out. This is what happened when the two of us were finally alone together. I told her that 
T had a favourite coffee shop, so I invited her there. The owner does everything from blending the beans to roasting them. T was good friends with the owner and so he had him make two types of coffee for him, one hot and one cold, roasted to his liking. When I said I was T's friend, the owner showed us to a private room with a sofa by the window that T often used. M ordered the hot coffee T always got, while I got a regular iced coffee. We spoke with the incredibly fast laptop that T always used open in front of us. It was the laptop he left behind in A's car after the camp. I called him to let him know that he forgot it, but he said to keep it for the time being. Feel free to use it until I get it back. It's stupidly fast, so it's good to pass the time. It'll burn your legs though, he said. At a glance, it looked like a Fujitsu, but inside was an NSD, an i70X, a motherboard I'd never heard of, 16 gigabytes of memory on the OS, and a battery with cell density double the normal one. Using the internet, I told M some of the history of T's family. His family history could be easily traced even on the internet with just his surname and family crest. If I write too much, then he'll be easily identifiable. So let's just say about a thousand years ago, they went from an imperial family to commoners. M said that T's mother also had a rather powerful guardian spirit. So when I looked up her maiden name, which T had previously told me, it turned out she was from a former imperial family as well. When we were students and I was in the car with T one day, he said he wanted to drop something off because we were near his mother's family home. We stopped at the gate, but it was a massive place, and I remember there was a row of storehouses behind the main house. They've got storehouses, huh? I said, and he said it was because the family used to be merchants in the past. His mother was always kind and thoughtful, but I suddenly understood why she seemed to be rather high class as well. All of that was no doubt why T had famous warriors and Kamisama watching over him. Next, I opened a hidden folder, put T's name in as the password, and showed M the first three parts of my friend in the tape. She seemed to understand T's situation and then started talking. Apparently, if we included the information from T's grandmother, the thing that killed E and put T's guardians in such a bad state was probably something that existed before Japanese people started to worship Kami. Because it was not created by man, it had a strong power to return to nothingness, but it seemed it was destroyed by being overwhelmed by great numbers. But in doing so, T's guardians may have used too much power. It seemed that T really was getting revenge for E. In the part where he spoke about being asleep at M's house, when he said he felt something strange on his face, I asked M about it, and she confessed with a red face that she was kissing him. I couldn't bring myself to ask if that was all she did. As for my guardian spirit, apparently it's an alcoholic peasant. There was no difference whether it was there or not, so apparently it wouldn't be able to protect me very well. A's guardian was a hamster. When I asked her to describe it, it sounded just like the hamster he had when we were in kindergarten. Not even T knew about that, so there was no way for M to know about it. Hearing that, I decided to believe her story about the guardian spirits. About T and C. T was always worried because I said that I liked C, but I said that back in elementary school. For some reason, T remembered it as being in junior high. It was no lie that C was always bright, fun, kind, and cute. But while everyone thought that way, it was like, there was never a chance for any of us. It was impossible for her to end up with anyone but T, you know? I guess everyone else felt the same way as well, 
because T was always like, people keep coming up to me to ask for my permission before confessing to C. What's that all about? And especially during that live performance he wrote about, even I, as a dude, found it so dramatic that I was kind of tearing up. As T sang, a cappella, without a microphone, and he was really good, and approached C, her expression of fear softened, and when he kissed her hand, the audience could clearly see the change on her face to one of confidence. By the end of the song, almost all the women in the audience were crying. Seeing that made me realise once again that I would never be able to compete with T. There was no way to get between them. Back in junior high, there was a time where C and some other girls were peeling mandarins and edamame for him. At first I thought he was making them do it, but the girls took it upon themselves when he said, Oh, these are tasty, but peeling the skin is such a hassle, so it's fine, I don't need any. T was seemingly oblivious to what would normally be taken as a sign of affection by anyone else, and he passed it off as women just being kind. And so, despite how close they were, unfortunately, T really did only think of C as nothing more than a close friend. T and C's families have secretly been arranging their marriage before T's memories fully return. The invites have already arrived. When I told C that I got my invite, she screamed, I did it! So, it was her behind it all. When I asked her about it, she said she recorded the conversation they had in the tent on her phone. I'll marry you once you turn 35, if no one else has. However, she cut parts out and kept only the I'll marry you part, and played it for his parents. But neither C nor T are 35 yet. That's very different to the promise they made. When I told her that, she said excitedly, It makes no difference if we wait. The result will be the same. It's fate. She felt that he was missing out on one of life's biggest milestones. Marriage. Women truly are scary. T apparently only heard once the invites were done and was completely fooled. I don't remember it, but... Apparently, I made a promise before I passed out, so I'll follow through with it. I can't embarrass C like that, he said before going to buy an engagement ring for her. I tagged along as chauffeur the weekend I got the invite. He bought a ring worth 4 million yen retail for 3 million yen, with the idea that it could be sold for living expenses should anything ever happen. What a conscientious guy. He specified all the details for it, including the weight, colour, transparency and such for the ten diamonds to be cut for it. It was the first time I realised that the price of the ring and the stones are different, and I was surprised to learn that the shape and height could be changed to match the stones as well. When we returned from the store, I saw him going over all sorts of situations in his head over how to propose as this would be a moment C would remember for the rest of her life. Once again, it hit me how great of a guy he was, but it also looked like he was trying to convince himself at the same time that he really did like C too. It was strange that he proposed after the wedding invites had already been sent out, but C and T went together to choose their wedding rings getting platinum rings that were comfortable for them both from a top-class maker. When I asked why they were blue diamonds embedded in the side of the ring, the soon-to-be bride said it was something blue, meant to bring good luck for the bride. C's ring had some small diamonds on the outside and some pink diamonds in the middle. It was very cute. Apparently the original design had a clear diamond, but T bought a deep pink one that came with a certificate saying, Fancy Vivid Purplish Pink, and exchanged it for that. After the size of the ring was decided, T went to the store alone and asked them to exchange the clear diamond for a pink one, 
as a surprise for C. He ordered it when he bought C's engagement ring because it was so pretty. He thought it suited C, and he liked the meaning behind it. I didn't even know precious stones had a meaning to them. T said it wasn't a big deal, but when I asked him more about pink diamonds, he said that they were the most beautiful part, cut from larger stones, and I was shocked to hear that one single stone was more expensive than my entire bonus. When I asked him if they had slept together yet, he shook his head. Eh? With C? I've never even thought about it. There's no way. There's no denying that she's a great girl, but I don't think I ever could. But I guess I liked her enough to agree to marriage. But there's something different. We're more like brother and sister. Guess I'll have to deal with that, huh? After everything he went through, all he could say was, I guess I liked her. Well, there you go. When I asked him why he spent more than my annual bonus on a ring for someone he didn't even want to sleep with, he said, Normally I'd split the price, but I figured I could at least make her happy with a present. Her smile brightens up the place, and that makes me happy. You gotta spend money to make money. There's no point in saving it at the end of the day. It's just paper. It can be a problem if you have too much, but not so much if you have too little. As long as I have enough to live, I'm perfectly happy. Apparently, it wasn't something he was buying in response to C's feelings, but rather simply something to make his friend happy. He chose it so it would overall enhance her image, but not outshine her. Yet his comment about money didn't convince me, so I pressed him on it. According to T, as long as we took care of our relationships with others, then things would work out, even if you didn't have money. If your stomach is full, then your heart will never be poor. But if you have too much money, That'll attract bad people, and thus fake friendships, making the risk of losing what's important to you all that much higher. He didn't want to take any risks if it meant losing us, his childhood friends. Not enough is just enough, he said with a laugh. C said that T was inspired by Kuroyanagi Tetsuko and sent 1% of his income and dividends to help feed people in poor countries. Even when he looked at a photo of E, he had no memories of him. Who is that? I don't know him, but he feels like someone important, he said. Even when speaking of past stories, he would say stuff like, There was someone other than A, B, C, D, and F, right? Someone very important. Seeing him suffer like that, I couldn't hold back the tears and excused myself to the bathroom. About M. She often talks about T, and ever since he returned to his parents' house, she's often seen there too. T never locks the door when he's there, so she enters without permission. He said that he doesn't want to lock his friends out. And T's cat, who is very cautious with strangers, entirely ignores her which shows just how much she's been there. She always watches over him lovingly as he sleeps. He still sleeps a lot. When he's awake, he's mostly doing rehabilitation or study. When I asked her why she visits him so much when he spends two-thirds of the day sleeping, apparently he would pat her head when he wakes up and say, M-chan, good morning. He would... Refuse if she tried it the other way, though. C told me that if you put a hand on his arm or chest or anywhere, really, then his expression would soften as he slept. It didn't matter who it was. Even I was okay. M told me she had liked T ever since they first laid eyes each other in April of the third grade of junior high. However, she grew worried about his guardian spirits after trying to talk to him one day, so she regretted avoiding him after that. 
Apparently, she tailed T for roughly a full year like a stalker. She saw the bullied kid that T helped gain more and more confidence, and so she wanted to help as well. About T and E. In the first part, T referred to E as something like a perfect manga character. I thought the same too. T always looked up to E, and A, the one who brought him into our group of friends, was like his real older brother. But E, well, he always thought of T as somewhat of an outsider, a cheat, and said there was nobody else on the planet as interesting as him. He was also a little intimidated by T's abilities, and so, in order to maintain his dignity as someone older, he tried even harder when he was around. He genuinely felt pleased whenever he was able to do something that gained T's recognition. About D and F. They got back together after that camp and in April this year, 2014, they got married. For financial reasons, everything for their ceremony was made by us. They're not planning on having a baby, so I'm praying that D's job will last a long time. When I told them that T said F was a little scary because of how she always acted like a big sister, she said it was because she was always worried, because he lived his life like he was in a constant rush. About A. He's still a temp worker. A year before the Lehman shock, T apparently told him, The economy is about to go to shit so you should try to find stable, long-term employment now. But at the time, he was just like, what the hell is he on about? But T did his best to convince him. Rather than finding a company that fits you, first, you need to make yourself fit the company. Then, once you understand the job, little by little, you can change things to suit you better. If anyone can do it, it's you. Now, he apparently regrets not doing what T said. He's a real-life example of not crying over spilt milk. About B. Me. T wrote that I was strong, but I've been destroyed by him before. I think most people have done something like this when they were younger, but I played a prank on C, who I found really cute, in the third grade of junior high, and this made her cry. When T heard her screams, he snapped and rushed at me, so I prepared myself, but the first hit knocked me flying. I held my arm up to protect myself, but he hit it so hard that it broke. If I didn't have it up, he probably would have broken my ribs. T only gets angry when it comes to others, so that was the first time I'd ever seen him like that, and even remembering it now is so terrifying that it gives me goosebumps. Anyway, I continued to protect my face from his fists, but I soon passed out. I probably had a concussion. I had swelling and cracks in both arms. I practiced Shodinji Kempo and Karate, but I'd never experienced anything like that even in a match or training against a master. I was good enough to compete in national tournaments, but that made me realize There were still people much, much better than me out there who I could never beat. Anyway, putting all that aside, I'm currently dating a nurse from the hospital T is in. Just having him around really does help with the ladies. But even though I have a girlfriend, I'm still interested in M as well. Ew, that's gross. Stop playing those. She once said about me playing adult-oriented games, so now I just do so behind her back. And now, a postscript. I went to T and C's wedding. It was Japanese-styled, with T wearing some old clothes with his family crest that had been passed down through the generations. He seemed quite used to it, putting it on with little difficulty after his shower and then naturally greeting guests immediately after. I told him that if his face was a little bigger, then it would suit him much better. C said that 
T's mother made her a white kimono, a colourful wedding kimono, a formal dress, and formal seasonal wear as well. I can't even put these on by myself, she said happily, and apparently T told her that she would have to learn flower arrangement, tea ceremony, and Japanese dancing next. That way, she could learn how to dress in them and how to behave as well. All the women in his family wore formal Japanese wear that they knew how to put on themselves without help. I was convinced the colour and design were made to make C stand out as the most beautiful person at the venue. She was so beautiful, I fell in love with her all over again. Seeing her in that white kimono made my heart jump, T said with a laugh. Seeing everyone else fawn over her honestly made me jealous. Finally, I have a daughter, T's mother said, overjoyed. She's so beautiful. We decided back when she was in elementary school that C would marry T, C's parents said, so happy they were in tears. Finally, that day has come. I almost fell for T myself as he led the trembling C to the altar in front of the gods in such a gentlemanly manner. I'm going to have to review the video, so... I can learn how to stand and behave too. The reception was held in an old traditional Japanese restaurant, but after the groom's address, T was back to his usual smiling self. It was a fantastic reception. T got his bike license at 16, so he never drank at events like this, saying he would regret it too much if he ever had an accident and was unable to move again. But on this day... He drank to his heart's content. Everyone kept pouring drinks for him, which he downed right away. Are you okay? I asked him, but he seemed to very much be enjoying himself. These are celebratory drinks, so as long as everyone is smiling and happy, I'm perfectly fine, he said. C struggled with the formal clothes she wasn't used to, and her wig was so heavy that she couldn't look down to get any food or drink. She was able to rehydrate, however, with the special fruits and such they had prepared for her. T blushed when he looked at her face for a moment, and then picked from amongst the fruit. Each time he fed it to her, he was apparently right on the mark as to which one she wanted, because she said, Bingo! I wondered whether he really did pick the correct one each time, and C said that he'd always been able to choose correctly, even without her saying anything. T said he could do the same even when they were far apart. I couldn't help but believe that the red string of fate really was real. M, who had been looking after T for so long, was also invited to the wedding. She seemed almost drunk with happiness. Si-chan, you're so beautiful. Ti-kun, you look so handsome. I wonder what approach she'll take towards them in the future. For their honeymoon, they plan to go to Hawaii with their parents, then go to Germany alone and rent a car, before travelling to Turkey, Greece, Italy and Spain. They plan to only stay in hotels they really wanted to, and other than that, whatever happens happens. They even plan to sleep in the car, if needs be. That was probably because of tea. It sounded like it would be a tough trip, but probably fun too. When they got back from their trip, they brought me a souvenir. I was impressed by the power of jewellery. Seeing C with her wedding ring made everything seem more real, and she seemed to shine more brightly than ever. I asked her to take her ring off to see whether it was her or the ring that was truly shining, but her presence felt totally different once she took the ring off. That pink diamond really does make the owner shine more brightly. T said that the pink diamond wasn't something designed to show off someone's power, but rather a mere tool to maximise the attractiveness of the person wearing it. The light apparently determined by the cut and claws. The size and ring colour 
all had to match the bearer of the ring. Otherwise, it wouldn't work, and the person would look wrong. These days, store clerks had more business sense than any other sense, like they couldn't see the forest for the trees. So when women spoke to staff, they would fall into a habit of simply picking the cutest ring rather than the one that fit them personally. Nice, isn't it? C said with a smile. I put a spell on it to make C a better woman, T said, and she turned red in an instant. They seemed to be getting more and more friendly, or perhaps things were heating up, because while T was his usual self, C was touching him more and more and acting like a wife around him. Well, she had finally gotten her first love after 20 years of waiting, so yeah, no doubt she was happy. As I looked at photos from their trip and they told me various stories, T said something that caught my attention. For some reason, my coins are eroding really fast. And maybe I'm just tired from the trip, but every now and then, I can see a red mist on the edge of my vision. Maybe it's because of the pressure on the plane, C suggested. At any rate, you should visit the doctor and get some tests done. But the moment I heard red mist, it suddenly hit me. If you've been reading this series, you no doubt would have noticed as well. That's the exact same thing E saw. Apparently, T doesn't hear any voices, but I don't want to lose any more close friends. E on the SD card is silent now. I'll ask C about the shrine near T's birth home and try to visit it as much as I can. I think I'll talk to M about it as well. Now, I have to decide whether to show C the video or not. I think T wanted to hide it from her, but now that she's directly involved, I think she has a right to see it. But I also want to respect T's wishes before he collapses. But I also want to speak to A, D, and F about it too. I don't know what the best course of action is right now. All I can do is pray. I think if T passes away, C will be destroyed. If gods really do exist, I hope they would not turn their backs on C, who gave up everything just to finally get what she wanted. All of this happened just a few days ago. I don't know what's going to happen to T, but for now, this is the end. In his stead, I'd like to thank everyone for reading.